Здравейте. Добре дошли. We have uh, English speaking people in the room, so we will have the presentation in English. Um, first, I want to say welcome. <laughs> okay. uh, I want to say welcome to each and uh, every one of you. Uh, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Vasil Kichip. I am engineering manager R&D here at Pace A Group. I will just open up the presentation. Uh, so, a couple of facts. We have we had this presentation two months ago in San Francisco at Oracle headquarters. Uh, the room then was full. We have uh, a lot of guys that couldn't find seats and stood up at the back. So, tonight I guess it's one of two things. First, it's either the bad weather or People here are too good at data science and they don't need our knowledge. I really hope it's the first one. Uh, okay, uh, so a friend of mine who is much more experienced in opening such speeches told me that uh, I should start like really low, really bad, so the guys could build up from there. So I hope I did a good job. <laughs> Uh, now let me welcome uh, Stanke, Dobri, and Yavor here on stage. <laughs> Stanke and Dobri are part of our machine learning team here at Paysafe, and Yavor is our DBA manager. So I leave the floor to them. Thank you, Vasil. <laughs> oh, welcome, guys. Uh, I'll start with something boring, as advised by uh, Vasil, so that we can build up from there. Uh, I'll start with this uh, scientific study. Uh, the guys written out there tried to find out what is actually innovation and what defines, what, what defines innovation. And uh, for this, they uh, made a meta-analysis of 80 million research articles in different fields of science, uh, trying to find out for those that are most quoted, because if you if you write something boring or something that is not actually new, nobody will quote you. But if you have a lot of quotations, chances are you actually found out something uh, <coughs> novel. So uh, they were trying to find out what is in the source of the novelty, and they they uh, found out the following: if in your because SAS is always based on something called, it's never something absolutely new. If in your study you are using uh, references to, like you're doing some physics study and you want to refer to Einstein <coughs> and uh, Newton, most probably you're not saying anything new. But if you refer to, say, Einstein and uh, Lao Tzu, the Chinese philosopher, you make a typical combination and Chances are you end up with something something that the other people will will like. So this is where we start. We have our existing knowledge. We add something really weird to it, which is a, a mathematical uh, study, which is two and a half centuries old, and we end up with some uh, pretty different, uh, pretty interesting results. Now, this is the agenda. Uh, it's already too late for it. A few words about PaySafe. We are an online payment company. We are moving money from here to there fast. There is a big difference between our business and, uh, say, a bank or some Western Union or whatever, because everything has to happen in split second with, with our business. We are doing, let's say, millions of transactions per day, but uh, in the area that we are discussing here, we are doing hundreds of thousands of transactions per day in our digital wallet product, which are Neteller and Skill. And uh, when you are making so much money, obviously there are people that want to use this for not really good reasons, for fraud, money laundering, uh, terrorist financing, and those people tend to be pretty smart. They manage to bury their patterns 
in a lot of transactions between a lot of customers. And when you have millions of customers and hundreds of millions, billions of transactions, it's not really easy to, to find out the, those patterns. On the other hand, we are online payment company. We cannot, we cannot say, okay, I'm doing a transaction, it will be settled tomorrow with the, with the next settlement. Everything has to happen in a second or two at most. So uh, in order to provide good user experience, we have to decide if this transaction is good or not very, very fast. And this is the challenge where we started, let's say about a year ago. We, I don't know if you know me, but I'm in the Oracle database area. I'm very well known as uh, Oracle fanatic. I, 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 for years and years and years, I believe there is nothing better in the world than Oracle, a relational database. We couldn't make it with the Oracle relational database. So we went to the Oracle graph. Uh, now, uh, one thing important that I have to tell you, I would really love if we can make this more of a discussion. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to interrupt us at any time. Uh, we, the three uh, key team members of this, me, Stanka, and Dobry, uh, each one of us will give one small souvenir at the end for his favorite question. So hit us with your best questions. Now giving to Stanka. <coughs> okay, so for each and every payment, we need to answer this critical question. And the answer of it should classify the payment in one of these three categories. We may sorry, we may accept the payment, successful scenario, we may decline, but we may be not quite sure. And uh, what we will do in that middle category, uh, we may fire some additional verification checks, or in the end, if we still are not sure, we will queue it for manual review. And you may think that manual review is something outdated, something that lives in the past. But actually, this is not true. Uh, it happens at a large scale still. And uh, I'm, I prepared some metrics. Uh, not in pay safe, but as, a whole, but as a whole in the world. And uh, in North America from 2016, you see that the, the numbers are pretty high. I have checked in 2017 the amount of uh, manual, the, the percentage, percentage of manual review is uh, decreasing, but the volume is increasing, so manual review is happening in large scale. Uh, so what's the problem with the manual review? Manual review is always costly because uh, you need human humans to uh, to make a resolution should we allow the payment or not. It takes time, so uh, the customer experience is pretty much influenced and badly, not in uh, in not in the positive aspect. So uh, we need to decrease the number of manual reviewed uh, payments. In the recent years, in in the last year or so, we experimented with machine learning models to predict will a uh, payment will be fraudulent or not. And I really believe that machine learning is one of the best practices for business to predict uh, will a payment will result in chargeback. It has a lot of pros. Uh, for example, you can easily spot anom anomalies and detect new uh, patterns. But it has a few challenges. It's not a silver bullet. And uh, we focused on the first two. And the main problem of machine learning as a whole is that it's hard to explain why a given prediction is given. And the other interesting challenge is that it's ignorant on connected data. And fraud is mostly about connected data. So we wanted to approach these two challenges. And uh, we decided to build this, this project plan to first make some powerful instruments for investigation in order to know uh, if a prediction has been given, why it was given, or just check fast why it's given. And uh, we wanted to step uh, further, what, to go one step further and to enhance the machine learning models with connected oriented features. And at the time we gathered our ideas, with, we were sure that we have so much data and everybody is saying that data is that important but I'm not sure all of the companies are taking the full 
extent and advantages of the data that they have. So we wanted to to do more with our treasures. And we felt that we were sitting on a golden eggs, but how, how to make it meaningful? And sometimes getting the right answer is by asking the right question. And we thought about it and end up with the, this question, why and how to better analyze connected data? And uh, thinking about that payments, payments network in PaySafe is actually a graph we end up using graph databases. This interesting article helped us to see that we are heading in the right direction. It's one of Gartner's article, and uh, it separates the graph analytics in five layers. The, the ones, the three ones on the left, are more atomic-wise. They are analyzing the customer as a separate entity in the system. The ones on the left, are more uh, like analyzing the customer as a part of the whole network. And by Gartner, and we think that this is also true, uh, that this analysis is more important and uh, tends to be highly predictive. What are the links between this customer and the other ones in the system? Sorry. You may think that uh, graph databases are quite hype and something exotic, pretty new. But graph theories, as Yamor said, is not new at all. It's nearly 250 years old. Uh, what actually graph theory is, you may all of you know, but still, I want to give you some definition just to be consistent. Uh, graph theory is mathematical study on structures used to model pairwise relations between objects. With graphs, you can model many real-life pro uh, real problems. And uh, graphs can be useful in computer science, social uh, science, and biology, actually really interesting there. There are hundreds of algorithms already invented. You can see some of them in the presentation. And uh, while graphs are pretty hot now still, hundreds of will be invented still uh, in the future. What exactly is a graph? So for the purpose of the presentation, the plots, uh, the pictures on the left are plots and the ones on the right are graphs. Graphs is something really not that sophisticated. It has nodes, the blue dots here in this graph, and the red links are the edges or arrows. Nodes or vertices, edges or arrows. And uh, you may have different and many definitions of the graph. For example, this one is directed one. You see there is direction here, and in the other ones mis are missing direction. Uh, you may have cycles, like this one here. Tree is a, a different subtype of uh, the graph. You, there is only one parent for any node. And there are plenty of more, really. I don't want to bore it now, but there are so many interesting other definitions. What is actually a graph database? So graph databases store data in terms of entity, the, the nodes and the vertices and relationship, the edges and the arrows between the nodes. And actually what the graph databases is, is a better way to explore connected data. Graphs are really hype at the moment, same as machine learning and big data, and they kind of related. I have prepared you some interesting article, and uh, the one that is related more to that presentation is the one in the middle. I really believe this is true. And it says that graph databases are the next generation of fraud detection technology. I hope you will convince you <laughs> somehow till the end of the presentation. So graphs are eating the world. Something that also, also shows it somehow is um, a metric from GB Engine. So this is a ranking site for the database storages, for the, GB, for the storage story as a whole. And uh, you may see that the graphs are heading up and up uh, by 2030 very confidently. And uh, you may, some of the vendors of graph databases may tell you that uh, the graph databases will be the future storage for any given real-time problem. We don't believe this is actually true because uh, graph databases also have problems and uh, at the moment at least is more having more like having the right tool for the right, right job because currently graphs databases don't scale well horizontally 
they scale as a separate disconnected graphs, but, as a, but one graph as a whole, even in neo 4 Enterprise version, they have problems with that. So graph databases are not that exotic anymore at all. Uh, they are pioneer graph databases that are oh, nearly a decade old, like Neo4j, IBM uh, Graph and Young's Graph. Actually, we have really interesting uh, Bulgarian graph databases on the text. They are RDA graph, but we are more focused on the property graph, so we, it's there, that's why it's not listed here. And uh, the big players are all also entering the market. You may see that uh, Oracle also have property graph uh, that is nearly more than three years old. And last year, Amazon, Neptune, and Microsoft uh, released their first version of their graph solutions. Actually, there is really nice, interesting graph solution by Redis Graph. Still not that mature, but I believe it will be very interesting in the future. Uh, Spark have their graph engine for calculation. There are specific queries, uh, query languages for the graph databases, and uh, depending on the vendor, there is different language. Uh, the most popular one is Cypher. It is introduced by Neo4j. And uh, actually, I think we missed really important slide. Sorry about that. Uh, and I want to um, introduce you with something, some more definition, more to come. So imagine, just to give you a little bit of context, sorry about the missing slide, but uh, just to remember what was what graph is. This may be good so because we will repeat that you know, if someone doesn't, um, doesn't remember. So uh, you remember that we have vertices and edges. And imagine that you have this definition of graph and extend it further and you have, imagine that you, have, you can have a label at any type and uh, different labels and any count on any edge and any vertex. So what labels we have here, we have labels like departments, software development and database administrations, companies, and employees. We have different types of edges, coworkers, part of, <coughs> and the key here is that we have key value properties on uh, any edge and any vertex. And with this kind of data model, you can actually model any type of real problem, real life problem. Sorry about going forward. So you know now why, what graph database is. And I want to, sh to tell you that graph databases are really performant when you are querying uh, unconnected data. Why? I'll give you an example. So, uh, if you have a question why user 9 is connected to user 1, in a, this is similar actually for, with a key value store, but if you have a relational table like this, and you have columns with user IDs and friends, what you should do? You should start from the beginning, get all the friends of user 1, get them all, and for all of the friends of user 1, go forward so that you will find 9. It, and if you find it, let's say, on the first iteration, everybody is, everything is cool, but uh, if you have more and more iterations, you should have to start any iteration from the beginning. And uh, as more and more data you add to the database, the time to search will increase a lot in relation to the, to the data that you add. On the same, in the same time, in the graph on the right, there is one little trick. Actually, I'll give you one more definition. So I this arrow here, one and three, are with, with distance one hop. And one and nine are in distance two hops. Conversely, here nine is one, two, three, four hops away from two, and so forth. So you may uh, you, you can set this little trick to de de decrease the number of hops to search, and uh, in this way, no matter how many how many circles and data you add in the graph around the hops, the time to search will stay the same. It will matter to add more data to the hops that are related to the search, but this is less likely to happen. It's more likely to add more. I mean, it will happen, but the more and more data will be added as a whole in the graph. 
So that's why it makes that stark difference for uh, grab the uh, millions and, mil and billions of edges. Uh, and then the performance is pretty interesting. Yavo is prepared a one interesting case study, H how, how fast it is one and the same query and one and the same data uh, in, uh, in relational database and in graph database. So about the query, query languages, uh, I, I just, uh, I'm repeat a little bit that uh, NeoFuG have this reused cipher. And uh, you may see now that uh, this is actually the, the entity, this is the vertex, so any, and here you have the edge. It's actually, I don't want to delve that much in the details, but it's pretty re readable. <coughs> Oracle have the same, almost a similar language, both has pros and cons. SparkQL, on text actually use that, uh, is kind of predecessor of Cypher. Gremlin uh, is more like library to, to generate the language and query the graph. I wanted to give you a comparison between uh, property graph query language and SQL, and uh, this query actually finds the pair of people who are connected to common person, person to edge nodes, to arrow nodes. And uh, you may think that this actually is really, really well-written query. <laughs> Imagine that you write it with joints. Oh, it will be uh, disgusting. And uh, still, it's not very really readable. If you have to change something in the query, it, it will be a problem. Actually, uh, in 2021, there is a plan to add property graph query uh, abilities in the SQL. So I hope you will hear more about it soon. Soon, with two years, three, <laughs> but we'll see. <coughs> so we consider different vendors. Uh, I told you NewFJ are the pioneers in that field. But for us, it was completely new sa setup. They had transactional storage and consistency. Um, it has a lot of, it's, it has big community. They are easy to set up. Uh, Cypher, I told you, it's a really powerful language, but uh, it's really expensive. Uh, DGraph, actually we have experimented in that. DGraph stands for distributed graph. But I told you there are also uh, almost any vendor struggles with uh, horizontal scaling of graph. And GraphQL is a functional language. I haven't listed it here in the previous slide. But uh, it's, it's invented by Facebook for resource, resource definition. It's more like similar to REST. So it, GraphQL is really unfortunate name, I think. We end up using Oracle Spatial and Graph because for us, uh, we, Oracle Spatial and Graph have different options for storage, relational database, age base, even more. And uh, we already had database gurus like our database guru is Yavor. He will give you more insights uh, how Oracle Spatial and Graph works. And uh, I believe oh, it's, it's always important to bear in mind the context of your company when you choose specific software. Redis Graph have interesting, uh, interesting graph application, but it's not very well mature. Agent Graph is multi-model storage. It has it's, it's graph database over relational database, and they tend to tell that uh, while you are having the, the table, the relational data tables, you have key value storage, and over that you have graphs. But we didn't want to start a religious war in our database department. <coughs> Now I'm, I will share more information about Oracle Spatial Graph. So as I told you, I'm Oracle database fanatic, so I really love the, the way we set it up. Uh, there are different options you can use the Oracle Spatial Graph, but uh, the way we did it, I guess is the most common way. Uh, you can put the graph in the Oracle Relational Database in a very special format, which means that uh, I know how to make a backup, I know how to make disaster recovery, I'll, I know how to make it highly available, I like it. On top of it is the uh, PGX server, the property graph execution uh, server, which is running on a separate machine or multiple machines. It's read only and it's completely in memory. It keeps the whole graph in memory. This is important. So first of all, it's read only. What does it mean? Oracle database is my single sort of source of truth. If this one dies, I don't care. I can have like tens of those, 
hundreds of those. They are simply VMs that are running the, the Oracle PGX server. Uh, the other good thing is that you cannot do anything wrong here because it's, it's read-only. The single source of truth is, is the relational database. On top of it, uh, so you can have visualization or you can have uh, data queries uh, versus the PGX server. Uh, here is it, here is it how, we, how we actually do it. We have our current databases. We feed the data with Golden Gate. Then we have real-time ETL written by Dobry. And then we have as much as we want PGX servers on, on top of it. Uh, it turns out it's very uh, efficient. Uh, in, the, uh, our, in our graph database, we have like 60 million edges, 4 million vertexes. It takes 72 gigabytes in the database and only 8 gigabytes of memory, which means it can run on, on a VM with 16 gigs of RAM, which is, which is, which is practically peanuts. Now, this is the real world example. Uh, some more details about it. So, we, we, have, we have to know when we are doing a transaction if there is a fraudster, a fraudster four, level, four levels uh, from us. So, we, we written the SQL query, and uh, the guys here know SQL. So, it, it, it's not something like, like stupid. Uh, we ended up for a very big customer that is very complex. We ended up with uh, 50 minutes to run the query for one day and for one week it, it, it doesn't really work. So we went out to Oracle and uh, told them, guys in the database, the graph guys can beat you. Uh, so please give us a better way to do it. And they were working, like I'm talking with really, really top expert in Oracle. They were working one month on, on top of it and they came up came up, by the way, this is, this is our uh, SQL. They came up with, with other query, which is much more like orders of magnitude faster. So for one day, it, it works for 20 seconds instead of 50 minutes. And uh, one week of data, it takes eight minutes to, to compile. Uh, the query is really unreadable. It's like 62 lines. And uh, still it doesn't work because I want to decide whether I should uh, let this transaction uh, go or, or, or stop it in split second. So if it works like for 80 minutes and you are a really big customer with a lot of transactions, th the customer satisfaction level will be really low. And uh, so this is where the graph databases are good. When you are looking for friends of friends of friends of friends of friends, when you are looking at the connection between, between the data. There are many use cases for the relational databases, but the graph database really shine when you're looking at the connection between the data. So our statistics for running the similar type of, we actually run four queries in the PGX server to get it on each level. Uh, so those four queries take about half a second, no matter what is the, the, the time period you're, you're looking for. So it, it really kills them all. And, uh, and this is the query. It's not only faster, it's actually readable. So, yeah, by the way, uh, when we made this presentation uh, in March in, in San Francisco in Oracle headquarters, we, we've been ranting against the Oracle Relational Database Engine for, for, for three days, I believe. And in the last day of the Anal Analytics and Data Summit, a guy approached it and uh, can you please come with us and uh, talk to our manager? Okay, who is your manager? Blah blah. We go for lunch out there, and uh, we get to meet and Andy Witkowski, and Professor Andy Witkowski. He he is very very senior in Oracle. He is like on top of the SQL engine developers. He's been with Oracle for 24 years, and he told us, "We can be the graph. We can make it work for you." Uh, th this this is the result. So. I, if he cannot do it, nobody can do it. And ah, one more fine detail. This query is running on, on very, very big exadata machine. This query is running on a machine that costs, let's say, $700,000, only the hardware. It has 180 CPU cores, which has nothing to do with the query performance, but it's nice to share it because I like it. <laughs> 
this one runs on a VM with 16 gigs of RAM and eight virtual cores. So <laughs> they are incomparable. So for those specific cases, the graph databases are, are, are killer. Now, about the visualization. There are different ways to, to visualize graph data. Uh, we, we decided to go with Cytoscape, not, not only because it's, uh, it's free, but because it actually works very well. Uh, the biggest competitor, I would say, would be uh, Tom Sawyer. They have really great visualization tools out of the box. But so far, we are, fine with, we are really fine with Cytoscape. And what we develop, what, uh, what we are talking about is really working now in production. So people are using it, and they are happy with it. So let me show you a, fee, a few screenshots, because we don't have time for live demos. And I actually never do live demos, because I may have troubles. So uh, this is one example of our graph. So uh, PaySafe has two uh, digital wallet products. One is Screw, one is Netower. So if you see green, this is Netower. If you see pink, this is Screw. Yellow is the one we're looking at. So we we are showing we are not show, showing anything new we always knew that like this guy sent money to that guy and that guy also sent money to this guy but showing it like this showing it like graph helps the for example the customer service or the risk department actually understand what what is going on so uh this is this is uh example for a basic graph uh, this is one more nice example. So we have somebody in the center sending out money to, to a lot of other guys. If you see this in Excel file, like transaction, 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 send the receiver, send the receiver. It's not easy to, it's not that easy to comprehend. W uh, some other tricks we are doing, for example, a red arrow means a lot of money, blue arrow means not that much money. Uh, this would be unreadable in Excel. Uh, all the arrows are pointing inwards. This is some network of somebody gathering money from, from many other guys. Uh, so do you have somebody working in a bank or other financial institution outside of PaySafe? <laughs> so this is a classical example of uh, money laundering. We have uh, placement layering integration. Somebody is sending the money to, to many, many accounts, and those accounts are sending the money to somebody else, and this, this guy is clean. I got the money from, from those guys. Let the money flow. Tens of customers sending money in and out. Uh, if you look at it I in a SQL query, yes, maybe if you are used to it, you can understand what's going on. But here, only with a, with a, with a glance, I can say red arrows, a lot of money. Now, this is when you have more than one level. And we have some more complex, like this one. Now, this, imagine it in Excel, th this simply doesn't work. N nobody will understand what's going on. And here, just with a glance, you can see, OK, a lot of money going here and some other going there. This is blue. I don't care about it. It's the same data that we always had, really the same data that we have for 20 years, just applying a different look at it helps us realize what, what is going on. So uh, yeah, one, one other nice thing is that we have data for both Screw and Netower. Screw is running on Oracle, Netower is running for uh, on Microsoft SQL Server. We get our total data on one place. And we can see that some people are doing funny stuff. And we can charge them for this, which is nice. Uh, we like it, it gets addictive i can show you many pictures we have three hours so no, no problems uh we see that this is a network of networks so we see two centers of gravity here this is the one we are looking at and this guy also had a lot of, a, lo a lot of money so how did i come up with all those pictures did i go on the database and click on this one and that one and, and the other until i get really nice pictures no because the beauty of the graph databases is that they, they have very strong mathematical background. And there are some predefined algorithms that you can, like if you have a good developer uh, like Dobry and Stanka, you can ask them to apply the graph algorithms on the, on the graph data and see what, what happens. This is actually how I came out with those pictures. You cannot get this with SQL. You cannot get this with SQL. So the algorithms we are currently using, and 
they, they are like out of the box with the PGX engine. They, they have dozens of algorithms out of the box, but the ones we implemented that because they make sense are uh, the page rank, community detection, strongly connected components, and the weakly connected components. So uh, this is strongly connected components. It means that uh, it, it will automatically detect for me from the whole graph or for, from some subgraph, it will uh, automatically detect areas of this graph, subgraphs, in which every vertex is connected to every other vertex following the, the, the arrows. Uh, weakly connected component is similar, but you don't care about the arrows. So it doesn't matter where the arrows are pointing. This is one weakly connected component, and this is other weakly connected. I, I get automatic detection of, of such networks. Community detection uh, is not that easy to explain. Uh, first, because it's really strong, uh, you, you, you need a lot of mathematics. And second, because I, I don't really understand what, it's go what is it doing. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, it is finding areas of the graph where the graph is most dense, wh where you have a lot, of, a lot of connections, a lot of edges between the vertexes. This is the community detection, works automatically and, and gives you, okay, for the payments for the last, like, let's say, one hour or one week, whatever, one year, give me where I have like, a lot of connections between, between the vertexes. Uh, page rank, it's more like supportive algorithm. Uh, it's very nicely used with the, with the other three. Uh, it's initially developed by Google uh, if you imagine that those are web pages and those are the links between the web pages, the page rank will tell you what is the probability. If I start from any random page, what is the probability of clicking on links, on links, on links, and ending up on some specific page? So, for, for example, this web page has very high probability for somebody to end up here because there are a lot of connections to it. This also has relatively high probability because it has only one link, but from a big influencer. So uh, if I use this with a strongly connected or with the community detection, I, from the other algorithm, I get set of, set of vertices. And with the page rank, I will know who is in the center, who will probably, wh where the money will actually end up at the end. Where is it more likely to get the, the final payment? OK, some more pictures. Uh, this is a strongly connected component. You see the ones with black are part of the strongly connected component because uh, you can go from each one to each one uh, following the arrows. And the other are not part of the component because they are one, uh, one direction only. Woo -hoo. Wait, boy. Community detection. OK, OK. Who is clicking? Okay, this is it. Using the right tool for the right jobs. Uh, now, the other thing we can, we can do with this uh, Oracle Property Graph Engine is we can use it to give us the, the analytics to detect the, the for example, the, to detect the communities. And then on top of it, we can ap apply SQL and query, query our good old relational database and find out and enrich the picture with additional data. For example, uh, we can query, OK, uh, all those people are exchanging money within our system. So this is within the teller. But where the, the money actually came up from? They cannot like appear from nowhere. They have to come up from, from outside of our system. And uh, we can run a SQL query and find that actually there is a, a, a Visa card here feeding the guy in the center, and then everything goes, go, goes around. <coughs> it's made with additional with uh, simple SQL query. So you can combine both. Uh, one more example, stay calm. All those guys sending money to the one in the center, big red arrow going here, oh, withdrawn with uh, money booker's card on ATM. Somebody, so something is going on with my keyboard, but more or less we have uh, the same picture here. But uh, the money in this very complex network are coming from uh, diners, MasterCard, Bitcoin, Visa, and Amex. And uh, finally, they're withdrawn with instant, instant rent. 
type of payment. So uh, you don't need to, because uh, the problem is that Oracle PGX server keeps the, all the data in memory. So uh, you are <coughs> limited because you cannot have like, you can have one terabyte of memory, but it's kind of expensive. So you can put in the, uh, in the graph only the things you care about when you're doing the analysis and everything else you can, you can enrich using uh, SQL from your good old Oracle database. Uh, some statistics, th those are actually not, not fresh. But uh, overall, with uh, some support from Oracle, we end up with a situation where we have every, every analysis is working for like five to six seconds now. And uh, this, is, this is good. Or, uh, this is for a period of three days, which means hundreds of thousands of payments. I show you the, the relational database <coughs> cannot do this. Stanka, have in mind something is wrong with the keyboard. Okay, so I use that one. This one too. This one? Okay. Actually, uh, fraud, fraud, fighting with fraud is a very interesting field because fraudsters are getting more and more clever and we have to be more and more clever too. So um, we, got, uh, we, we worked in that field for a long time and we wanted to share what anti-fraud techniques do we use and do we think that matter in the anti-fraud war. <laughs> so uh, we have row engines. Actually, they are the widespread and the oldest technique. We have graph technologies. We spoke a lot about them here. We have machine learning algorithms. We already mentioned them. We have customer verification, just, j j just they are listed here. Um, device fingerprinting, this is verification and uh, validating the terminal where uh, the customer, from where the customer is browsing outside. It, it may be phone or laptop address name verification, and, well, it's great, really. Yeah, that's the two. Is there some IT guy here? <laughs> <laughs> okay, we are back on track. So, few words about row engines. Row engines are really right widespread because they can be edited by non programmers and uh, they can manage the system, so uh, the programmers thought that they can ship some row engine that uh, the business people should, can edit and everybody is everybody's happy. But unfortunately, if the row engine uh, database grows up to, let's say, thousands of rows, and it tends to grow really, <laughs> at least in PaySafe, and uh, uh, it's sometimes hard to find which of the rows are outdated, and uh, row engines are really poor at uh, spotting new patterns and anomalies. And uh, as a whole, they are really hard to manage and to find new patterns. But it really is to add new rules from non-developers. That's why they are so important. Oh, I don't know. I think we are okay. No. So machine learning helps a lot with the problems that rule engines have. Here, you can very well find and spot new patterns and anomalies in the, in the data. Uh, actually, uh, we have experimented with different scores, like identity behavior score and have ensemble on them. You have you can use that scores in different predictions. But this is, this is something interesting that we all already use. But so we have the machine learning model help with anomaly detection and new patterns. But again, machine learning is not a silver bullet because as to, as I told you in the beginning, it lacks context and uh, it's really hard to to train a machine model, it needs a lot of data. Almost any data scientist will need, we also, we always say we need a lot of data. <laughs> and uh, I will give you a quick example. If you have a cut hot plate in your kitchen forgotten, and you have plenty of kids, <laughs> and uh, some of them is touching the hot plate, a clever kid, hopefully, will not touch the game. But what will machine learning algorithm do? It will touch on different place, uh, in different places of the plate, it will touch on the different times of the day. And because it needs a lot of data, where? Where is hot? Only there or where? That's why machine learning algorithms need a lot of data. But still, are they are very powerful. And um, what, we would, what we think that, well, kind of crazy, sorry about that. But graph databases solve the problems that the machine learning models have. 
So with graph databases, you can have context and, mo and trace multi hop relations. And uh, you can feed a lot of predictive features to the machine learning algorithm. And you can use graph databases in, uh, we think at least we have used it in two ways. The first one is, I, we, you saw the query languages and they are query languages the same as SQL. So you can query the graph databases real time to, uh, to check something and let's say, for example, if you decide that you can stop the payment if you have fraudster up to the second hop or fire up some additional verification. This can be one, one purpose of using the graph database, but the other one is, let's say you have some sophisticated machine, uh, machine learning algorithm that needs context and you can feed the connected oriented features like uh, uh, you have frosters up to the fifth hop, but you don't have frosters up to the fourth. You, you may, you, you may uh, think of many different connected oriented features with uh, unconnected data. And these connected data features tend to be highly predictive, and you don't need that much data to train the model. That's why I grab the database and that, perfor uh, that performance. And they are really performant uh, 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 on connected data. That's why they are so useful for real-time queries. But again, it's not a silver bullet, because, horizontal data, uh, uh, because we have horizontal scaling challenge. So we believe that uh, the modern anti-fraud engine will be a synergy of all the three. You have the graph database that can feed connected-oriented uh, features to the machine learning models, uh, or it can uh, some graph-oriented, let's say, if we have a fraudster up to the second thought, hope I told you, it can be directly uh, used in the raw decisioning and stop the payment or fire some additional verification. The machine learning prediction for uh, fraud can be passed also to the raw engine. So we believe that the synergy of all three will be the successful anti-fraud engine in the future. Okay. <laughs> I don't know, it's getting... My, my picture keeps coming up. <laughs> so uh, where are we now? We have provided powerful instrument for investigation. I know uh, we actually didn't... It was not the initial intention. We wanted to get a feeling of how graph databases perform. Because we, we have, fraud is mostly about connected data, and we need to trace connected data very fast during the payment processing. That's why we wanted to get a feeling how it performs, and as I will show you, they're performing really well. Um, we are currently experimenting with feeding features into machine learning data, and uh, it makes a lot of sense. Actually, uh, there is a way, and we are experimenting now, to feed a, a topology of the graph in the same way um, as you can feed learn word embeddings in the machine learning model. You can uh, in feed the graph embeddings into the machine learning model. Maybe in the future, when we are ready, we can share some insights about it. And uh, we have plenty of the ideas of the business uh, people that are looking at the graphs, and they decide, wow, Look at these network accounts. They are transferring that much money. We can charge them more <laughs> if we have this stuff. So there are plenty of ideas coming up, not only for charging, I hope. So graphs are really powerful. I'm really, um, I hope I made you a bit curious and you may invest some time to learn them. Actually, anytime when I hear Yavor speaking about graphs, I'm kind of shocked because he's database guy. You know, in the first way when when decided to use graph, I was sure that he will not allow any kind of different storage than relation on that one in our company. Now I'm so surprised that uh, so uh, graphs are addictive, and uh, so many interesting things could happen. And graph theory is not that uh, uh, is not uh, that uh, hard to learn at all. I hope next one. Okay, we are finishing so. We will go to the beer soon and this thing will start to bother us. So in summary, I really believe that uh, the time to stop a payment, uh, if, if you think it's fraudulent or not, is uh, uh, during payment processing. Afterwards, it's too late. Imagine how we use case. Uh, someone may bet on, uh, in a betting site, they lose the money. And in the next five minutes, we don't have any chance to return the payment. Uh, so 
in the real, uh, in the real time payments world and uh, banks are also getting real time, so it's not only our problem, it's, it's a problem as a whole, uh, you have such a narrow time to stop the payment. And uh, if in that narrow period you can make a link analysis like uh, on, upon money move, upon a threshold hit or account creation, uh, it will, it, you may have a chance to, to stop a chargeback which will be very costly and to decrease the cost and this will be very valuable for the fintech industry. But traditional storage technologies are really hard to, 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 perform, to make performant queries uh, real time. So graph databases help a lot. So the key takeaway is that graphs are really useful for real time decision making on connected data. And uh, you have really powerful graph analytics you can get one step further by feeding collection-oriented features in machine learning models. And you can do so much artificial intelligence even without uh, uh, machine learning with grass. I want to, I want to finish. Oh, we have it from the first time. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, I will show you how much information you can get uh, by just querying the graph. You can get a lot of feeling and know, knowledge of how the data is at the current state. But you can step one. You can go one step further. There are so many researchers going into the other directions, and to predict what will happen in the future. Imagine that uh, you have three individuals, A, B, and C, and A, B are enemies, but A and C are friends. Think about it. What will be the relations? Think about in life. What will be the relation between B and C? It's not a tricky question. What? What do they? Enemies. Enemies, of course. They will be enemies. Wow. So, I've, I've, I have uh, put some resources on the previous slide. Uh, this is actually a very interesting talk. You can go for it. Uh, there are some uh, uh, graph algorithms uh, books if you want. If you are curious about that, you can go for it. And that's it. So. <laughs> we may have the questions here or a beer if you want. Okay, go. Uh, thank you for that great presentation. It's uh, really interesting. Um, I don't think I'm like Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, there are some things that uh, are really interesting. How you put uh, all the relation of data into the in memory. It's not in memory, but you put into a 16 gigabyte of memory. Uh, so I guess you use only part of the properties of uh, payment. Yeah. For example, the amount. I guess it's uh, important here to rank the if if uh, certain uh, if certain uh, edge yeah, is yeah. more important than other. Uh, how many properties do you use to transfer? Exactly. Uh, and uh, do you differentiate between the different vertices? For example, uh, I saw that you use the emails for vertices. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have some grouping between? Can I go? For example, if six uh, different people from one company make payment to, to another one, uh, okay. do you take that in account? Because uh, they are connected, uh, no, because they are part of the same company, but in the graph uh, they are separate vertices. Okay, so, so, so we have an additional link between them, which might not be visible on the graph. Okay, so I really uh, like uh, the idea of Oracle Spatial Graph, the really the only idea. I, I'll just explain about the, the, the what can be queried and then I'll, I'll leave to Yavor to show you how, because there were so many questions, how the information is fed into the into Oracle Spatial Graph from the relational database. First about the nodes. So any node has a label, uh, and this one here, uh, it's colored in purple because it is a screw customer. You have two wallets. And the one, this one here, is uh, green because it's a net over one. They are both of type customer. But we have different nodes. I've got the deposit option and we have withdraw option. With, uh, we have it here. So we, we may have different uh, nodes of different types. So this one is customer, both, both customers with property company. And the company property may, uh, is different here. It's a net over here, it's screw. We may have different type of no, here payment option. Or this is actually a deposit option because the money is coming from, from this option here and this actually is withdrawal option. And uh, 
it, it, one, it, one more thing that is coming live tomorrow is uh, we will want one more type of, of vertex, which is uh, merchant. And it will look like a star, because we wanted to make it like something different. So yes, we do have different types of vertexes. Yes. and uh, In the same graph. And it, it, it's kind of in the books that I've uh, added in the reference guide. It, it's it's really in, again it's a matter of common sense, and there are some tricks to model because you need to build ha the model of the graph than some kind of scheme like in the database. It's more agile. It's not a relational database. You can easily change uh, change edges, and you can easily add different types of nodes. It's not outer something uh, statement. Uh, and uh, for example, you may treat, let's say if you have the email, you may treat it as a property of the customer or as a separate node. And sometimes it makes a, a lot of sense to make it as a separate node in order to, uh, to easily evolve your in time. You, if you're interested, I can give you more details about uh, that. So, uh, is this answer your question about the, and about the database, how their the information is fed there? Yes, on the first part of your question, uh, this is this is our picture, how we actually do it. Uh, we, we get the data from, from the relational data, from different, really different relational databases, MS SQL and Oracle, using Golden Gate. We put it as it is uh, in, the, in one Oracle database that is designated for the graph, but we can put it even in, in some common Oracle database. And then off, on top of it, with some triggers and uh, near real time jobs, uh, we have ETL which is converting it from fr from relational to, to graph tables. And uh, by the way, there is really a lot of development within, not only within Oracle, within the graph world, how to store graph data in the relational databases. Currently the implementation of Oracle, and I don't have the safe harbor statement from Oracle, but I can tell you what the current implementation is, uh, you basically have two tables, one for edges, one for vertexes, and each table has more or less uh, vertex ID, property ID, value, property ID, value, property ID, value, next vertex, property value, vertex, property value. So it's, it's not very efficient, it's like a key value store in the relational database, which I really hate, but it's, it just allows us to, to, to make, and uh, Dobri did really wonderful uh, real-time ETL. It allows us to, to get simple insert statement from the relational type of storage into the graph representation. And then when you load it in memory, it's performing really well. So, so the magic is converting it to one thing that actually ends up being more or less key value pairs. Um, can I add something? And I really believe it's too late. We have to go to the beers and I'm really happy to discuss more of it, but I, I just want to... Uh, you to have the chance just to relax a little bit. I just want to add something before that. So the beauty of having uh, the relational database as your single data, a single source of truth, you can build different graphs on any time. So you may uh, you may need a graph with customers and emails, but then you may use different graph with customers and device IDs, or you can add it to the same graph. In you know in it just by writing a migration and starting you can start a new instance. So by having the uh, relational database as a single source of truth, you you can build as much graphs as we want and in the schema we want. And can we combine the output of the two? For example, I want to study the transactional behavior of people that are most relate related with fraudsters or have the strongest relations with fraudsters. Uh, you can combine yes. Uh, uh, I can give you more details of, of how. Uh, currently, there are no queries. Of, uh, there is no an option to query two graphs at the moment. Uh, but uh, yeah, for example, I want to evaluate uh, the connectivity coefficients on one graph. This is the links to fraudsters, and then I have no idea what is their transactional behavior on how many hops they reach yeah. to the fraudster and what transactions they make, how they inform themselves. So I want to see this on a separate. Uh, graph, is it of course, and you can uh, calculate them in parallel and combine the results. You can do everything. Actually, for that visualization that you've shown, in order to be really fast, any hop is asynchronously calculated. Show you, so you are waiting for the one that takes uh, the, the longest time. So you can do uh, everything. You can combine three queries to different graphs, then uh, uh, combine the result. Uh, 
you can add more data to the graph. I think sky is the limit here because you have such a powerful data model that you can see with uh, different labels and different key value pairs on other edges. Uh, I uh, okay, go, but I really believe we have to go to the beer because it's too late. And to you, I'd be very happy to have all of your questions and have so many discussions over there. Yeah, well, what Tanka mentioned also during the presentation is that there is uh, currently work uh, being done uh, for combining the graph languages within the SQL. And we got aware of some of this work uh, really deep uh, when we were in, uh, in the Oracle HQ. The, the standardization committee is working on it. They're still looking for the best way, but finally what they want to do is you should be able to treat the graph more or, like, more or less like a, like a table. So you can do graph query and get a table as an output and join it to other table or to other graph. You One day, it. eventually. But uh, I hope you, you will hear of, of that in the future, so it will be interesting. Okay, so let's go to the beer. <laughs> 